What's up guys? Welcome to G Whiskey. My name is Jeff. This is a channel where I offer my thoughts and opinions on a specific whiskey and once in a while I'll throw in a list and other whiskey related content as well. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I put an idea out on YouTube and Patreon. I asked you guys if you had any questions for me and I got a lot of great responses, some input, some questions from you guys and that's what I want to tackle in today's video. So today's video is kind of like a Q&A session. It's your questions for me answered. Stick around. So this is my first time doing this kind of video, but I figured I'd spice things up on the channel and I want to be a little bit more interactive with you guys. So I put it out there. I asked if you guys had any questions for me and I got a lot of great feedback through the comments, through Patreon, through email. You guys are a curious bunch. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to answer all of the questions you guys put out there. There were some personal questions in there. There were some political questions in there and they were valid questions, decent questions. I do appreciate them. But at the same time, you know, this is a whiskey related channel. I do kind of want to stay on topic. And beyond that, there were so many whiskey related questions that I don't think I can get through all of them in one video. In fact, I'm sure I can't. Which means there were a few of your questions that got left out of this video, but don't worry, I didn't forget them. I'll try and include them on the next video. I do want to make a few of these Q&A type videos, interact with you guys a little bit more directly. I think it's kind of fun. Uh, also, some of the ideas that you guys had were more ideas for a full video than a quick question that I can answer here. But again, the input is appreciated and I did take it to heart. Some of them will make it into full videos. Anyway, I don't want to drag this on. Here's a bunch of your whiskey related questions for me. Also, I've got a mystery pour in my glass here. It is completely unrelated to anything we're talking about today, but I included it anyway because I'm a dramatic person. So stick around after our discussion. I'll let you know what that is. And that's it. Let's just jump into it. In the meantime, if you could kindly leave a like down below, that'd be greatly appreciated. Neat versus water versus ice. This one's actually a little bit controversial. There's some people out there with pretty strong opinions on this. I'm not one of them. Uh, I tend to prefer my whiskey neat, but not necessarily. If I've got something with a higher ABV, definitely I'm going to play around with water a little bit just to see what it does. Oftentimes water does unlock a little bit of that complexity, but I don't really have a stance where it's like you should always drink it with water or without water. If you want to use water, use it. If you're not inclined to, then don't. Honestly, I don't really care. Um, do I drink my whiskey with ice? Not, no, not, no, 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 but you can. Is new make worthwhile and what's it like? That's another great question. I'm going to answer the second part first. Uh, what is new make like? Well, new make is very spirity. It can be very hot. It can be very astringent. So is it good? Not really. I mean, some of it's okay, but it definitely can't compare to a mature whiskey. I think the reason most people buy it or sample it is because it does provide context. You're getting to know the distillate in its purest form. It's deprived of any cask influence, which is interesting. It lets you get to know the whiskey in a very raw state. So I'll try it if it's like offered to me or if there's a sample at a whiskey show. I think that's great, but it does have to be free. You know, like my money's limited. I'd much rather spend my money on something that's interesting and enjoyable instead of something that's just interesting and contextual but not necessarily enjoyable. Uh, so I do think it's worth trying, but I don't know about spending money on it. I don't. What is your favorite Cavalan and have you tried the Virgin Oak? Another great question. Uh, I have not tried the Virgin Oak, but I've heard it's fantastic. Of the Cavalans I have had, I don't think my answer is gonna surprise you guys. I tend to like the Solus Sherry the most. I like pretty much anything in the Solus line. I absolutely love the bourbon. I love the vino, but the most consistently high quality batches that I've had personally, let's keep in mind these are batch whiskeys, has been the sherry. So that is going to be my answer. But, you know, a question like that really highlights how much more I need to explore from the Cavalan range. You know, I do live in Taiwan and they have a million whiskeys out there that I've never tried. So, yeah, more exploration is needed. Any insight into the whiskey scene in Taiwan? Yes, and also what a fun question to answer. This is such a vibrant place for whiskey. We have, I think, one of the biggest markets in the world per capita when you take into account the population. Uh, we have amazing prices. We have amazing selection. We have loads of IBs. We get loads of like special releases like these. But beyond all that, people here really know their shit. Like it's not just a big whiskey market. It's a sophisticated whiskey market. People here are pretty discerning. They know their whiskey. Uh, Sherry's quite popular. Japanese stuff is pretty popular. IBs are really popular. Uh, and of course, Taiwanese are proud of their homegrown stuff. They have brands like Cavalan here. They have Nanto here. And there's actually, I think, one or two other distilleries that have popped up in the last few years that are showing pretty good promise. 
We also have lots of shows, lots of exhibitions here. I feel like we get one every two months at this point, especially now that COVID is kind of calming down. Uh, and a lot of the Scottish brand guys are pretty surprised when they come over because we have not just insane crowds, but the type of people we get in those crowds. There's a lot of young people that are into whiskey. There's a lot of women that are into whiskey. We get locals from all walks of life. And again, they know their stuff. So it's a really vibrant, really exciting place to be for whiskey. Honestly, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Which brand would you like to buy out and turn around? Now, this is another really cool question, one I almost made into its own video because really there's so much to talk about here, but I'll just answer it as is. So basically the gist of our question is, if I could own a distillery and kind of turn around its practices, which one would it be? So maybe it's a whiskey that's currently coming out at 40, 43%, colored, chill, filtered, if I could turn all that around, make it into a craft whiskey for us whiskey snobs, which whiskey or which distillery would I choose? And definitely there's a lot of options that come to mind. I am a big Dalmore fan. Of course, there's nothing natural there. I do wish Ben Romick would give us 46% ABVs across their entire line. Uh, Balvenie's definitely annoying. A lot of weak, overpriced whiskeys with missed potential there. Uh, there's really, there's so many options to choose from for this. But I think my first choice might actually surprise some of you. I'm gonna go with Glenlivet on this one. It's actually one of my favorite house styles. Of course, they do cater to the casual consumer and they make a lot of money doing that. So, you know, fair play to them. But I mean, they have such good whiskeys. I've had IBs from them. I've had special releases from them that are just stellar. Uh, and, you know, we do get good stuff peppered in from time to time, but it's pretty sparse. If I had the chance to go in and sort of revamp everything, put out everything as a craft presented, naturally presented product for us whiskey nerds, that would be the dream. And I know some of you are probably shaking your heads right now, but Trust me, if we got that, if we got a naturally presented Glenlivet across their entire line, that brand would blow some minds. So, you know, it takes really well to a variety of different types of casks. So you buy some nice casks for it, you give it a good age statement, you put it out at a good ABV. Chef's kiss. Thoughts on blended scotch. Do you ever drink it? Which ones float your boat? Uh, okay. Yes, I do drink some blended scotch. I like some blended scotch. It's not necessarily always my go-to. It's not my favorite. I definitely do prefer single malts, but there are some killer blends out there. Uh, just last year, I made a list of top five special releases of 2021. And on that list, I included this one here. Timorous Beastie, 12-year-old cast strength. It's beautiful stuff. Listen, there's a lot of really good blended scotches to be had. We've got stuff from Compass Box, Douglas Lang, and of course they're not all winners, but once in a while you do come across a really cool one. Yeah, I like that Timorous, I like a Compass Box Spice Tree. You know, there's a lot of options. So definitely I don't have any problem with blended scotch. No, it's not my go-to. Am I a bit of a snob when it comes to single malts? Yes, I do prefer them, but nothing against a good blend. If it's well-reviewed, if people are sort of into it, if people are liking it, I'll definitely give it a go. Whiskey regrets. Bottles you should have purchased but didn't. This one's easy. And you know, there's a million things that I could answer here. Honestly, I could make five videos just about this topic alone, but I'm gonna answer this with probably the most obvious and most blaring missed opportunity when you think about whiskey. And that's gonna be Japanese. When I first got into whiskey, I could buy the Yamazaki 18 for just over $120 US. Uh, I would go through age-stated Yamazakis. Akushus, Takatsurus, Hibikis, and you know, they weren't cheap, but before the Japanese whiskey bust, they were all reasonably affordable. And they were good, man, so definitely, if I could go back in time and just stock up on anything, I'd buy a bunch of Japanese whiskeys, wait 12 years, sell them, get a house with the money, keep a few left over for myself to enjoy. Yeah, uh, really, affordable Japanese whiskeys. Those were the days. What is funk and how do you define it? So this one's a little bit controversial because there's a lot of people out there who have their own definition of funk. I don't know that there's any kind of like accepted consensus for what it is. So I'll tell you what I think funk is and tell you what, if you think I'm wrong, you can yell at me down in the comments. For me, it's gonna be something that's either lactic, farmy, or fermented. So if it's a lactic kind of thing, you might have milk, spoiled milk, a certain cheesiness to it. If it's farmy, you might have these manure type notes, these vegetal type notes. And if it's fermented, you might have this you know, fermented bacteria type flavor note. 
I don't know. Again, this is really hard for me to define. I'm struggling. I'm grasping at straws myself. Like, this is a question that pops up a lot because people hear the word funk. They want to know what it is. Fair enough. And then people have a tough time sort of defining it. I know I certainly do. So the best I can do is something lactic or farmy or fermented, but I'm not sure that does it justice. So, you know, this might be a great question to throw back at you guys. What's your definition of funk? A lot of you, I'm sure, might be able to define it a little bit more elegantly than I have here. So whatever your definition of funk is, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to read it. What happens to all the bottles I buy? Do I share them? Do I finish them off by myself? So this is a good question. I have a lot of open bottles. And if I'm being honest, I have too many open bottles. When I realize that a bottle's on its last legs, uh, I'm more likely to share it. So if I have friends that want to have a session, maybe I'll bring it to theirs. Maybe they'll come here and we'll just polish it off together. I'll say this one's, you know, it's on its last legs. Let's get rid of it. Let's do it in. And then we do. So um, that's usually how it goes. I don't know what you mean by do I finish it off by myself? Like if I'm alone, will I drink it myself occasionally? Um, I don't drink a lot by myself, but I mean, I, I might, I might. That being said, there are a lot of bottles that I have had open for quite some time, several that have been open for well over a year, possibly even two for some. So, you know, that's not ideal. Whiskey does not have an unlimited shelf life. What I do is if it's a peated whiskey, I'm going to try and finish it quickly. If it's a particularly volatile whiskey, I'll try and finish it quickly. Or if the bottle's like as low as our Benromic 21 here, if it's this much, you know that's going to catch too much air. So you're better off just doing it in. So yeah, it's something I do have to keep an eye on. Everyone should if they have a you know larger collection. Uh, certainly, I do have too many open bottles and that's something that I should probably work on. Tips for infinity bottles. What do you do with your bottles that are almost done? So infinity bottles are a cool idea. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't really do them. I have done them in the past. Uh, they always make for an interesting little experiment. Rarely do you get a great whiskey as a result, but it's always good fun. Actually, that is something I might come back around to trying again. Uh, I've done it twice before and both times the whiskey was an absolute mess. But to be fair, that's pretty much on me because I was just tossing anything and everything into that bottle. So if I had a bottle on its last legs, I would just toss it in with no regard for the balance of the whiskey or whether or not the flavors would complement what was already there. So I guess that's the best advice I can give. If you want to do an infinity bottle, try and put in stuff that's going to complement the whiskey, that's going to benefit the whiskey. If you just have a complete Franken whiskey where you've added anything and everything to it, it's going to taste really chaotic. It's not necessarily going to be very enjoyable, but if you're mindful of what's in there and you try and add things that are going to complement it, you might actually end up with an interesting blend. Um, as for your second question, what do I do with my bottles that are almost done? Drink. Are you getting all of those tasting notes by yourself in real time on video? No, no, I'm not. I prep my videos in advance, so I don't necessarily plan out what I'm going to say verbatim, but I do plan out the gist of what I want to get across in each take. And that does include tasting notes. So I'll sit down with the whiskey prior to shooting. I'll jot down a bunch of the notes. Definitely when I am shooting, I'm going to notice new things or different things that I'll pull out and I'll include that in the video too. So again, it's not like strictly scripted, but there are some ideas in there. There's some tasting notes that I've got in the noggin before I get going. And I remember a while back, there was a guy that actually got pissed about it. He got pissed that I wasn't pulling it all out in real time. This guy thought it was disingenuous that I wasn't pulling out all the tasting notes in real time on video. And listen, there are a lot of reviewers that do that. They are more talented than I am. I do need a little bit of a roadmap. So yes, my videos are not scripted, but I have some notes jotted down. I have some ideas. There's certain things that I want to get across in each take and that is prepared in advance. So yeah, there you go. Why do you do that pulling move? Uh, I don't know. It's not something I have ever done naturally outside of doing a video shoot. It's a weird thing to do. It makes no sense. I don't know why I do it. I think my initial justification for doing that was it was a way to visually differentiate the finish from the palette. Like if you saw me doing this, you knew I was talking about the finish. But then also before I talk about the finish, I say, and now the finish. So that's really just not helping anything. Thing is, I've been doing it for so long that I can't really stop now. It's basically like my signature move. Uh, but does it make any sense? No. Does it add anything to the drinking experience? No. Does it make me look like an idiot?
Yeah. What is your guilty pleasure whiskey? You know, I was going to do a whole thing like we shouldn't have guilty pleasures. We should like what we like. Blah, blah, blah. It was a whole speech. I don't really feel like doing that. Uh, guilty pleasure. Dalmore. Yeah. Um, there's some duds in there, but I love the house style. I love the cast play. Guilty pleasure. Dalmore. What's the bottle that started it all for you? So my answer to this isn't going to be as interesting or as dramatic as I think some of you are hoping for. This bottle is probably long gone from most of your memories, if it was ever even there in the first place. But I remember drinking this whiskey for the first time and having that moment that we all had. It's that moment where your mouth and your brain and your senses come to the mutual understanding that you fucking love whiskey. Uh, I remember tasting the creaminess and the sherryness in this bottle. And I came to the realization right then and there that this is going to be my new thing. And that bottle was Ben Reich 12, but not the Ben Reich 12 of today. This is like three Ben Reich 12s ago. So this is the one we've got today. There was another one that looked like this prior to that one. And the one that got me started looked like this. It was called the Sherry Wood. Beautiful stuff, very rounded, very creamy. It's a far cry from the modern Ben Reich that we have today. And it definitely wasn't an epic whiskey, but it was lovely stuff. Uh, and you know, any other bottle might have set me off on my journey, so perhaps arbitrarily it just ended up being this one. But because of that, I'll always have a soft spot for it. So yeah, Benrig 12 Sherry Wood got me started. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for all your questions. I hope my answers are satisfactory. Uh, keep in mind, some of them didn't make it onto this video. I will try and include them on future videos. Also, some of your suggestions were more video suggestions, full video suggestions. Those were taken to heart. So again, thank you for all the input here. I know some of you stuck around to find out what the mystery port in my glass is here. I am drinking Ball Blair 15. It's a beautiful whiskey. I will be reviewing it at some point, so that's something else to stay tuned for. And I think that's going to be it for today. So thank you very much for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time. Bye.